Welcome to worship this morning. We're glad that you're with us, both in person and online, uh, for our worship this morning. Just a few announcements we want to highlight. We remind you that the outdoor worship is happening on August 6th at the Beckers. That is a potluck, just so you're reminded of that. And swimming will be available after the service, not during. So, you know, if you want, just to let you know. Uh, Phyllis Lofgren is hosting coffee hour today, so we thank her for that. Um, the flowers today are given by Ken in honor of Rebecca's birthday this morning. So. <laughs> Was that a surprise? <laughs> we have uh, Theology on Tap coming up tomorrow at 6.30. That's our fourth Monday. Um, the Mud Hens uh, tickets, you need to get the money in by next Sunday for that if you signed up for that. Next Sunday is also the end of the collection for Undy Sunday, Undy Month. And then we start school collection because school will start in a few weeks. Um, last Sunday in, in the sermon, I mentioned some baseball players, some of our youth that had done a service project. Uh, we also had some more youth do some more service projects. So Cali Vieira and the Longobaw men, Michael and Lamar, they wrapped 100 hot dogs for share of the warmth. And also Claire and Gwen Cousineau read at the Clinton Library. So these are our kids in action. Uh, so appreciate them for the gifts that they give to us. Let us rise for the session. <coughs> Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who greets us in this and every season, whose word never fails, whose promise is sure. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of our neighbors. Merciful God, we confess that we have sinned. We have hurt our community. We have squandered your blessings. We have hoarded your bounty. In the name of Jesus, forgive us and grant us your mercy. Righteous God, we confess that we have sinned. We have failed to be honest. We have lacked the courage to speak. We have spoken falsely. In the name of Jesus, forgive us and grant us your mercy. God is a cup of cold water when we thirst. God offers boundless grace when we fail. Claim the gift of God's mercy. You are freed and forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. We sing our gathering hymn. grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. 
In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen and amen. Let us pray. Faithful God, most merciful judge, you care for your children with firmness and compassion. By your spirit, nurture us who live in your kingdom, that we may be rooted in the way of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Congregation may be seated. Good morning. The first reading today is out of the book of Isaiah. The preface, there are no other gods besides God. The word of the Lord does not fail to come to pass. We can trust in God through whom Israel and we are redeemed. Beginning in the fourth chapter, verse six. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last. Besides me, there is no God. Who is like me? Let them proclaim it. Let them declare and set it forth before me. Who has announced from the old the things to come? Let them tell us what is yet to be. Do not fear or be afraid. Have I not told you from the old and declared it? You are my witnesses. Is there any God besides me? There is no other rock. I know not one. The word of the Lord. The psalm today is Psalm 86. We will read responsively. Teach me your way, O Lord, and I will walk in your truth. Give me an undivided heart to revere your name. I will thank you, Lord, my heart and the glory of your name. For great is your love toward me, and have delivered me from the pit of death. The band. But you, O Lord, are gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger, and full of kindness and truth. Show me a sign of your favor, so that those who hate me may see it and be put to shame. Because of you, Lord, have helped me and comforted me. The second reading today out of the book of Romans, the preface. For Paul, true spirituality means we experience the reality of the spirit, which enables us to pray as God's children, keeps us in solidarity with creation, and gives us unseen hope that God will liberate us and creation from the bondage of sin and decay beginning at chapter 8, verse 12. So then, brothers and sisters, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption. When we, when we cry, Abba, Father, it is that very spirit bearing witness to our spirit that we are children of God. 
and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If, in fact, we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory about to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not of its own, not of its own will, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and will obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in labor pains until now, and not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly while we wait for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. For in hope we are saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what is seen? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Gospel according to Matthew, the 13th chapter. Jesus put before the crowds another parable. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to someone who sowed good seed in his field. But while everybody was asleep, an enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and then went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared as well. And the slaves of the householder came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? Where then did these weeds come from? He answered, An enemy has done this. The slave said to him, Then do you want us to go and gather them? But he replied, No, for in gathering the weeds you would uproot the wheat along with them. Let both of them grow together until the harvest. And at the harvest time I will tell the reapers, Collect the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. Then he left the crowds and went into the house. And his disciples approached him, saying, Explain to us the parable of the weeds of the field. He answered, The one who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world, and the good seed are the children of the kingdom. The weeds are the children of the evil one. And the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are angels. Just as the weeds are collected and burned up with the fire, so will it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will collect out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all evildoers, and they will throw them into the furnace of fire, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father. Let anyone with ears listen. The Gospel of the Lord. Congregation may be seated. I know we don't have children this morning, at least any that want to come up, but (laughs) how many of you are savers? Savers. (laughs) The wives are going and the husbands are going. Uh, I'm I'm a saver. I have a pair of needle nose pliers that has that coating on it. The coating is almost gone, but they fit my hand perfectly. And that's the tool I grab to, you know, fix pretty much anything, you know. Those need those flowers. They should be thrown away. They should be replaced. But I'm saving them because I like them and I'm comfortable with them. Um, so I'm saving them. We get into this habit of we want to throw things away. Uh, we're a throwaway society, I guess. And, and that comes down to people as well. We want to dismiss people. We want to just toss them if they don't measure up to our standards, right? But we're not the ones that get to make that call. God makes that call. God is the one that decides, and we leave that in God's hands, which I'll talk about in the sermon momentarily. Let's pray. 
We thank you, Lord, that you're a God of grace and compassion, a God who's slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Help us to commit others to you and not to our judgment, because you are the one who decides. And it is in your name that we pray. Amen. <clears throat> grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus the living Christ. So last week we dealt with the parable of the sower and we learned that different kinds of soil produce different levels of results. Today we're confronted with the question, what do you do with the weeds? Because we know that those who have tried to plant a flower garden or a vegetable garden or even just a plain ordinary lawn, the weeds are going to come. Those of you who are gardeners are familiar with Murphy's first law of gardening. When weeding, the best way to make sure you're removing a weed and not a valuable plant is to pull it. If it comes out easily, it's a valuable plant. <laughs> and of course, there's a corollary to that law. To distinguish good plants from weeds, simply pull up everything. What comes back will be the weeds, right? We've had a garden in every place we have lived, from North Dakota to Michigan, with varying degrees of success. And weeding is my least favorite part of gardening. Even when Diane and I try to make it a bonding process, and we do it together, we never seem to stay ahead of it. And if you ask her, she will tell you the story about the year of the tomatoless garden when we lived in Warren. One day I was in the hardware store and I came across this stuff called preen. Oh my gosh, the miracle drug for gardens. And I thought, I'm just going to surprise her. So I tilled it into the garden and I raked it and I planted away and I didn't read the fine print which said, not for vine plants. We had no tomatoes that year at all. Needless to say, we went back to the old-fashioned weed-pulling process. Listen again to Jesus' parable from the Message Translation. He told another story. God's kingdom is like a farmer who planted good seed in his field. That night, while his hired men were asleep, his enemy sowed thistles among the wheat and slipped away before dawn. When the first green shoots appeared and the grain began to form, the thistle showed up too, the farmhands came to the farmer and said, Master, that was clean seed you planted, wasn't it? Where did these thistles come from? He answered, Some enemy did this. The farmhands asked, Should we weed out the thistles? <clears throat> he said, No. If you weed the thistles, you'll pull up the wheat. Let them grow together until harvest, and then I will instruct the harvesters to pull up the thistles, tie them in bundles for the fire. Then gather the wheat and put it in the barn. If you take Jesus literally, this is a very scary parable. The weeds are going to be thrown in the fire and burned up. Now Jesus isn't actually giving us a guide to growing good wheat, of course. He's talking about human behavior. But one thing is for sure, in this scenario, you do not want to be a weed. It's like a funny story I heard from a Roman Catholic friend of mine. In the Roman Catholic Church, seven is traditionally the age of reason. And when children reach seven, they are expected to attend Mass and go to confession. Why? Because at seven, they are accountable for their sins. One five-year-old girl was impressed when she learned about this, and she went to her older brother who had just turned seven and greeted him with the words, Congratulations, happy birthday, Matthew. Now you get to go to hell. <laughs> what an honor. You finally arrived. You can go to Satan's domain. That's scary. But let's be clear on one thing. Judgment is an important fact of life. Paul stated it clearly in our second reading. So then, brothers and sisters, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if you live according to the Spirit, you put death 
to death the deeds of the body, and you will live. The reason some things happen to us is that we are reaping what we have planted. Judgment is a fact of life. And you and I may look at this parable and say it's horrible that the weeds get thrown into the fire, but that is the way life is. It's absurd to sugarcoat reality. If you plant bad seed, no use praying for a good harvest. Most of the time, you're going to get what you sow. But what is more dangerous is trying to figure out what other people are going to reap or setting ourselves up as the judge over others. Some people, I'm sorry to say, get their holy kicks in separating people into acceptable and unacceptable, worthy and unworthy, good and bad, wheat and weeds. But notice what happens in this parable. The landowner's servants come to him to tell them that there are weeds in his wheat and ask him if he wants them to pull them out. He tells them, no, wait until the harvest, and then he will separate them. Harvesting weed in Jesus' time was pretty tough work. The harvesters would use sickles. Everybody know what a sickle is? It's this big handle with a blade on it, and you go back and forth, and it was hard, dirty, tough work. We're told that the weeds in Jesus' parable were a poisonous variety called bearded darnel. In the early stages of growth, it would almost look exactly like the wheat. It was impossible to distinguish them. Later, when it was possible to tell them apart, it was too late. The roots of the wheat and the darnel were intertwined, so you could not pull them up without tearing out the other. So Jesus said, The landowner was wise, and he said to them, No, let them grow together until the harvest. So the harvesters were not allowed to separate the wheat from the weeds. So what does this mean for us? Or like the disciples said to Jesus, Tell us what this means. A constant theme in Jesus' teaching is that his followers are not to pass judgment on others. This is very important. Traditionally, the primary sin of highly religious people is being self-righteous and judgmental. We tend to judge for ourselves who is fit for the kingdom and who is not, who is spiritual and who is worldly, and that is a dangerous tendency. We forget that when we judge others, we're looking through some pretty smudged lenses. And sometimes we criticize others unfairly. We don't know all their circumstances or their motives. Only God, who is aware of the facts, can judge. Jesus said we have enough to do to look to our own acceptability rather than spend time evaluating or accepting others. We're told not to judge because we are not perfect. How does the old saying go? Until you walk a mile and another person choose. We're supposed to leave it to God to judge the wheat and the weed. But there's a second, even more important reason we are not to judge. When we pass judgment on others, we distance ourselves from them. Pretty much anyone who's been brought up in the church or watched NFL or college football, has seen that yellow sign. What does it say on it? John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Yada, yada. We know that verse, right? Does anybody know what verse 17 is? The verse that comes right after that verse? This is what it reads. God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through Jesus Christ. So Christ did not come, come to condemn, but to save. And so it is with us. We're not here to judge. Our task is to love and to witness God's love to them. You see, the real problem with passing judgment on others is that it does not allow us to be vehicles of God's grace. Our central task, our main job number one as Christians, is to help others experience God's grace. 
just as we have. And we cannot do that if we are condemning. And we don't know what hurts they are carrying. So the teaching of this parable is clear. There will come a time when the wheat is separated from the weeds, but only God is in a position to judge which is which. So in the meantime, let us focus on what God has called us to do. That is to love all people, to witness to the amazing grace of God, the amazing grace of God shown to us in Jesus. Amen. Please rise as you are able as we confess our faith in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Confident that God receives our joys and concerns, let us offer our prayers for the Church, those in need, and all of creation. <clears throat> o oh God, you call your church to announce the gospel of reconciliation and truth, both near and far. Guide your church as it seeks your wisdom and shares it, trusting your spirit, bearing witness among us. Hear us, O oh God. You brought forth all creation and called it good. Direct policymakers to protect lands and seas. Bring rain to sun-parched fields and protect areas impacted by natural disasters. Hear us, O God. You desire peace among nations and peoples. Guard our neighborhoods from hatred. 
watch over police officers and firefighters, and teach us to advocate for those who live in fear. Hear us, O God. You are gracious and merciful, comforting those who suffer in any affliction, especially Rick and Judy, Owen, Debbie, Brian, Martha, Bob, Audrey, Nan, Tim, and Jim, Donna, Juliana, David, Rain, Van, Mark, Hillary, Reagan, Nancy, Sherry, Martin, Minerva, Pastor Sarah, Pastor Hank, River Raisin Retired Pastors, Rick Webb, Tim Lentner, Rich Rentner, Al Nelson, Emily Frank, Frank Payne, Gary Leaking, and Synod Storyteller, Pastor Sarah Mayerflat. Our confirmation class, Carson and Juliet, the people of Ukraine and those in Turkey and Syria impacted by earthquakes, and those who have sustained tornado damage. Sustain your people living with HIV AIDS. Provide shelter for all who are unhoused. And release any who are unjustly imprisoned. Hear us, O God. You name each of us as your children. Guide our hospitality ministry to welcome all, our education ministry to equip all for faithful living, and our social ministry to enact the gospel in our community and the world. Hear us, O God. You send faithful people to proclaim freedom from bondage and to renew your church. Encourage us by the witness of the faithful departed, so that we may live into that same hope. Hear us, O God. And your hands, O God, we commend to all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy, through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you. Please share a sign of the peace. <clears throat> God's peace.
Christ. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right our duty and our joy that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. which was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. It is not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We feast on God's meal of love for us together. You may be seated.
Please rise. <clears throat> Let us pray. We thank you, generous God, for the refreshment we have received at your banquet table. Send us now to spread your generosity into all the world through the one who is our dearest treasure, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. And may the God who calls across the cosmos and speaks in the smallest seed bless, keep, and sustain you now and to the end of the age. Amen. Amen. Go in peace, share the harvest.